Look at this crowd. You guys are duking it out all the way till the end. I appreciate it. I also appreciate my runners today. Uh, you, guys, you guys are going to be my sprinters, right? Okay. So they're going to start doing a dynamic warm-up right now for the next five minutes. Do we have any certified athletic trainers? Okay. Um, when we start, I'm going to need you on hand just in case someone like blows a hammy. It could happen. I hope you guys are in shape because you got some sprinting to do, and I expect a lot. Okay. Um, this is a great privilege to talk with you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I am trying to have greater humility in 2016. When you learn something new and it's brand new to you, it's really easy to learn. But when you are faced with something that challenges your uh, current ways of thinking, a lot of times the things that hold back learning are your own, is your own pride. And this year I'm trying to strip that down so that I can uh, try to grow even more than I have to this point in my career. And so I'd like you guys to take down my phone number and my email and reach out to me. And if you want more, if you have more questions about repeated sprintability, I can't promise I have the answers, but this is how you'll get my attention. Give me some direct feedback about my presentation today. That's what I'd like. That's how you'll get my attention, because I really want to do a good job with these presentations in the future. And that starts with your feedback. Um, that's not to take away from the NSEA's feedback. I really care about that, too, so please do that. Okay. When I entered Utah in 2013, I had no idea I'd focus on repeated sprintability as a part of my PhD. But for me, a part of preparing our athletes for sport is preparing them for our, the people we face year in and year out. This wasn't necessarily our style of play, but Oregon created something new. And then several Pac-12 opponents that we have to face every year started to copy. So we have to look at the extremes of biomechanics and physiology that our opponents use in their style of play, and we have to prepare our players for that, and that doesn't start the week or two before that match. It starts the beginning of your offseason. And so now I started looking into how can we train our athletes to be able to beat Oregon and then some of those other really good schools. And I stumbled upon repeated sprint ability. And this goes back to 2013. At that time, I didn't even know, I'd never even heard of it. And I'm embarrassed and ashamed to admit that, but it's true. So if you work with a sport that has serial sprints, and sometimes there's periods in the match where those sprints are crammed together with a little greater tempo and shorter rest intervals, and maybe this presentation's for you. But now I'd like to briefly distinguish between high-intensity intermittent sprint activity and repeated sprint exercise. Repeated sprint exercise is defined by a series of sprints, maximal effort sprints, lasting less than or equal to 10 seconds with less than a minute rest. Okay? Get used to this figure here because what we have on the y-axis is time or the number of sprints, and on the, excuse me, the x-axis and on the y-axis is the performance variable. If that's cycling, that will be power or work. If it's sprinting and you're taking times, it'll be time. Could be velocity, it could be acceleration. This figure is used over and over again in the research, so it's good to get to know it, because that's what you'll see when you start to read about this topic. Intermittent sprint exercise is defined by a series of maximal effort sprints lasting 10 seconds or less with longer rest intervals that are greater than a minute. The only thing that distinguishes these two types of exercise is that rest interval. And now one minute might seem arbitrary, but there may be a little bit of truth to it. Bishop and Claudius asked 17 sports athletes to go through a series of 18 four-second cycling sprints. They gave them two minutes of rest, and there was no drop-off in performance with the longer rest intervals. But in this study by Gleister, 
10 sports science students perform 12 30 meter sprints. And when they had 65 seconds of recovery, there's just a little bit of drop off. And then when they drop that recovery down to 35 seconds, there's a much greater drop in performance. And so that's why this one minute cutoff might be important. And I think that's how Bishop and Gerard define repeated sprint exercise with that one minute rest interval. So let's talk about ways to test repeated sprint ability. You guys ready to go? Okay, because we're on in about two minutes, three minutes. So make sure you're ready. Have you guys done any buildups and maybe run a sprint or two? Okay, great. My athletic trainer ready? Okay, I'm going to need you. Okay. So for the purpose of today's presentation, I've had to cut so we fit everything in. If you look in the book, you ha actually have a little bit more. This is a, uh, one protocol I've used. Uh, it's a 40-meter uh, shuttle. It rolls every 30 seconds. It takes anywhere from six and a half to eight seconds for the players to run this shuttle. They go 20 meters out. 20 meters back. We start them a half meter behind the timing gate. Okay, that gives them a little time so they can lean forward and their head doesn't trip the gate. And then when they start, they run through it. I like this protocol because it's change of direction and there's only one timing gate rather than two. Now we're going to see the real thing. Uh, now we're going to do 10 by 20 meter sprints rolling every 20 seconds. All right. I love to infiltrate rock music into my work. I'm a huge ACDC fan. I love it. All right, so I basically take ACDC songs, I throw them into a, a system called Audacity, and I cut them up. Those bells are from Hell's Bells, and that can is for those, who about, uh, for those about to rock. And I make all my sound files based on that, and that's what you'll hear here in a moment. Okay, so uh, Tim, you're going to run our Brower, okay? Um, how many sprinters do I have? I have three? All right. So uh, one of you, you're going to be here with the Brower. I need one more volunteer, someone who can run a stopwatch, maybe from their phone. Okay. What's your name? Justin. Justin. I'm going to have you go in the middle aisle. All right. And then one more of you in the back. I need one person in the back who's got a stopwatch. Coach, what's your name? Brett. Brett, would love to have you help out, okay? So we've got three stopwatches. We're gonna, going to use the Brower here. You'll need to start a half meter behind the Brower. Okay, just a half meter. Yep, it's just a half of a step. And then you guys just find a line. Um, what we'll do is, uh, I need two coaches to stand up and give them a start and finish line on each sprint. That's what I need. We're going to run these sprints as a group. Coaches, you need to get up and do your jobs because these guys are going to sacrifice their heart and their lungs and their legs today and hopefully not their hamstrings. So I need you to cheer them because this stuff isn't easy. But we have to experience the things we put our athletes through. So that's why we have a few volunteers today. All right. So what we'll do is we're going to go off the sound. When you hear the bells start, that's a one-minute warning. Coaches, I need you to shout out the time. Stopwatches, you're going to have to run back and forth within that 17-minute recovery so you can get the time on each side. It's all right. Everyone needs to exercise. Okay, that's the one minute warning. When these four bells stop, we're at 45 seconds to go until we start the protocol. You guys ready? I need you guys to give everything you have. Otherwise, this won't work. The first sprint has to be everything. And you gotta get back on the line and get ready. When you hear the next two bells finish, that's a 15 second warning. After that, you'll hear one bell. The start of that bell is your five second countdown. And when that cannon goes off, it's time to work. Okay, here we go. Getting closer. Coaches, I'm going to need you here. These guys stepped up and said they're going to run, so get up. I need to see you. 15 seconds, boys. Coaches, shout out the times. Take note. Take note. Five seconds. Come on. Here we go. Boom. What do we got? 2-7. All right. Shout out your time so coaches around you can hear. Focus in on a coach so you can take note of what's happening to these times. Next bells. Five seconds. Get set. Come on. Let's go. Let's push. Let's push. Woo. Good stuff. Hey, 
We can't be pulling Usain Bolt here and slow down at the end when you just set a world record. All right? You got to run through. Here we go. Let's go. Come on. Here we go. This is number three. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Come on, boys. Good job. That's three. Seven more. 283. He was 27. Now he's 283. Come on. Pick it up. Here we go. Here we go. Come on. That's it. I know you guys are better than this, coaches. I know you're better than this. I've seen you coach before. Pick it up. These guys are working hard. Let's go. Come on. That's better. They're going to need you to help them dig deep in these final half here. Come on. Come on, 289. Let's go. Stay under three. Let's go. Come on. Stay under three the whole time. Come on. Let's go. Come on. Let's go. Let's go. Here we go. Five seconds. Get on the line. Come on. Let's go. Let's push. Let's push. Nice job. Hey, you sprint all the way through back there. Let's go. If you do it, let's do it right. Come on. Come on. Here we go. Come on. You got this. You got this. Let's go. Good. Good. We're getting closer. Okay, I'm going to get a head start. I'm going to be your rabbit. Okay, you're going to be my tiger. Here we go. See, you like that? That was from you. Here we go. Come on. Let's go. You don't really do that. You don't really do that. I was just doing that for the, for the presentation, okay? That was just part of the act. You don't really do that in real life, okay? Here we go. Come on. Got a couple more. Let's go, guys. Where are we at, Tim? Come on. Let's go. We're almost there. Finish through the gates. Let's go. I, I tend to get a little bit excited about things like this. Okay? So I apologize. I'll settle down. Now that we've tested repeated sprint ability, we need to know how to measure it. There's a little bit of confusion in the research about how to do that. And when you read the research, they'll talk about this thing called repeated sprint performance, and they refer to that as repeated sprint ability. We also talk about repeated sprint fatigue, and often that's referred to as repeated sprint ability. So what I've decided is that repeated sprint ability is the combination of both. Okay? Repeated sprint performance is pretty easy. That's simple. I'll show you that in just a moment. Repeated sprint fatigue gets a little bit more confusing. Repeated sprint performance is simply the sum of all of your sprints. So whatever you're using to measure the sprint, you add that up, and that's your repeated sprint performance. There it is. Repeated sprint fatigue is a little more confusing. The fatigue index, anyone heard of that? Okay, fatigue index is the difference between the first and final sprint expressed as a percentage. Sometimes they'll do the best versus the worst. Sometimes maybe the first two sprints compared to the last two sprints as an average and then and expressed as a percentage. One problem with the fatigue index is that it does not account for every sprint, right? Here we are, these guys just ran 10 sprints, and you're like, what? You only counted my first and last? That's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. And the error and fatigue index is really high. It's through the roof, like up to 60% error. So that means your athletes have to change by like 120% for you to be confident. It's a real change. It's kind of crazy. So the current recommendation is from people who've done a lot more research and repeated sprints than I have is that fatigue index is not the way to go. Slope is another option. And slope works really well when you have a linear decline in performance across sprints. Do not assume that that's the case. Look at your data. Make sure the characteristic is linear. And if it is, it works great and the error is really low. So slope works out sometimes. 
But sometimes it's not a linear decrease in performance, as you can see by Gleister's work here. Across the first five sprints or so, it might be somewhat linear. There's a curve to it, but then across 10, it's definitely not linear. And across 20 sprints, it's, it's really not linear. So if we tried to extrapolate and now estimate their performance from that slope, we would overestimate their repeated sprint ability because we would say that the athlete is actually better than they are. So the sprint decrement score is currently the recommended strategy for measuring fatigue during repeated sprints. And the sprint decrement score is the sum of all sprints divided by the, your ideal performance expressed as a percentage. Okay, the sum of all sprints, what is that? It's your repeated sprint performance. The ideal performance, okay, this is your repeated sprint performance. The ideal is your best performance multiplied by the total number of sprints. And the, and the sprint decrement score is that difference. Now, this is currently the mo considered the most valid and reliable strategy. There are problems. The research suggests that sometimes this method can have error of up to 50%. So my recommendation is that make sure you really find out what the level of error is in your test and do everything you can to reduce that error so you reduce the smallest worthwhile change so that when you test your athletes and see a change, you have greater confidence that it's a real change and not just in the noise. Okay? So, so this can still be very problematic, but if you do a good job with it, you can bring that error down. So to sum this up, repeated sprint ability is the combination of repeated sprint performance and repeated sprint fatigue. And when I continue this presentation and you hear me talking about repeated sprint performance, repeated sprint fatigue, please know the difference in the two. So let's just go through some of the pros and cons of field testing. First of all, you can make these tests valid and reliable if you work really hard to make clean programs and clean protocols with low air. So that's a benefit. You can, as long as you meet the definition of repeated sprint exercise, you can use different types of change of direction drills, and you can kind of match it. You can do passive rest, active rest, match it to, you know, the specific demands of your sport. Right? The main goal is to elicit fatigue. Now, uh, so we can get repeated sprint performance, repeated sprint fatigue. It's less data intensive than some of the laboratory stuff. I, I do repeat sprint testing in the lab, and I hook up to all these physiology gadgets, and it's just a mountain of data. And by the time I get all the data analyzed, these guys have graduated. <laughs> so um, one of the drawbacks is you can only do one athlete per setup. So if I only have one set of timing gates, I can only test one athlete at a time. In the uh, video, I have three timing gates, so I can test three. They have to come in every 10 minutes, basically. They warm up, and then they do the test. So it's time consuming. And if you set it up and stagger like that, it's not time consuming for the athlete, because they don't have to stand around, but it's time consuming for the person taking the data. There is a call for group repeated sprint tests. Um, Barbero Alvarez has published two papers using GPS to test repeated sprint ability amongst uh, groups of athletes. And it looks like there's some promise there. But just be skeptical. There is still a pretty good level of error in that testing. I think it's going in the right direction, but there's still some error. You might be able to clean it up if your players wore two GPS units, and then you use the average of the two to get your velocity and your acceleration markers. That might be a way to reduce some of the error in your testing. We at Utah have uh, come up with uh, repeated sprint tests that we can do with 40 or 50 athletes at once. And we call it the uh, Utah Test of Exhaustive Sprints, or the Utah Utes. So that's an acronym, Utes Protocol, Utah Test of Exhaustive Sprints. Anyway, <laughs> unfortunately, I won't show it today. Uh, here's a little secret. I'm currently refining the protocol. And I don't want to give you this protocol and send you down uh, the wrong path. And the secret is that uh, I have three different teams at Utah using this protocol, and three different teams are using the youth protocol, and it's different for all three teams because I'm troubleshooting and I'm going through the process of trying to make a better test. So we started it with football, then we 
Um, started it with the men's basketball team, then with our volleyball team, even though I'm not sure if it's necessary for them, but the strength coach wanted to do it, so I said okay. But they all have different protocols. The coaches don't really know the subtleties and the difference in the sound files and stuff, but they're different. And I'm trying to work it out. So maybe in another, year, another year's time, I can give you what I think will be the best way to go for that. Until then, call some of my colleagues at Utah. Maybe they'll share it with you. All right. So let's talk about the science behind repeated sprint ability. Now, there's a ton of science. And I've just, I'm only going to grab a little piece of it today. And I don't have all the answers. This is why I'm researching and trying to learn about it. I'm only, you know, two years into this stuff. I've only just been applying it with our athletes for about a year. So I'm, this is new to me. It's totally brand new. So I don't really have the answers. I just read. All right, so let's jump into it. Um, when I think about repeated sprint ability, it's the combination of performance and fatigue in my point of view. It's this combination. So what that means is that there should be a continuum. Slow and unfit athletes will have the worst repeated sprint ability. I call them slugs. Slow, unfit, guy or gal. Slug, right? They're good people, but they're just slugs. Okay? So then someone with moderate power but high endurance can be matched by someone with high power but low endurance in terms of repeated sprint ability. Superior repeated sprint ability is expressed by those with high power and high endurance. And I haven't thought of a fancy acronym for that one yet. You know, slug to something. Help me think of that and maybe send me an email. Okay? We're, we're working on it, though. All right. So uh, now this case here, the high power, high endurance athlete is what I'm most interested in. And it is possible. Some of us think it's not possible, but it is. And Bishop and his colleagues demonstrated that. He took a group of elite hockey players, females, and a group of female cross-country runners, and he matched them for their VO2 max. That's aerobic capacity. And he had them do a repeated sprint test. Of course, hockey players are more powerful athletes. So they had greater repeated sprint ability Okay, and that's mainly due to greater repeated sprint performance. That's what contributed to it than the cross-country runners. Cross-country runners had less repeated sprint fatigue, but it doesn't matter because they're slow. So it really calls to the importance of your first sprints. Right? And I'll read this. Repeated sprint performance hugely depends on performance of the first sprint. In other words, it's kind of good to have some fast parents. Right? Now, Bishop and his colleagues also matched people for initial power output and separated them by their aerobic capacity. And these individuals have relatively the same power output, and it was the ones who had greater aerobic pass capacity who had better repeated sprint ability due to less repeated sprint fatigue. And this might be an example of that high power, high endurance athlete. Repeated sprint fatigue hugely depends on muscle respiratory capacity. So if VO2 is cardiac output times AVO2 difference, that AVO2 unit is, is, accounts for the respiratory capacity of the muscle. So this story starts with ATP, right? Calcium moves the troponin, tropon tropomyosin moves, and now exposes the uh, active binding site, the myosin, and then ATP is released, power stroke, right? ATPase, ADP, inorganic phosphate, hydrogen ion. But now we have to recycle that ADP, right? Oh, yeah, it's this that allows Jordan to slam dunk from the free throw line. Got ahead of myself there. But we have to recycle ADP, and we do that by combining it with phosphocreatine. Now, with the help of creatine kinase in the cytoplasm, we recycle ATP by donating the phosphate from phosphocreatine and creating a creatine molecule. Now we've recycled, and the process continues. Right? This, to me, is extremely important when it comes to repeated sprint ability because during the first sprint, phosphocreatine, the phosphagen system, is the pr primary supplier of energy. And while 
the oxidative system and the glycolytic systems switch on the last sprint, phosphocreatine is still the primary supplier of energy in the last sprint. But we don't have a massive amount of phosphocreatine. After a single sprint, oh, excuse me, I jumped ahead. So and what happens while this, you see the creatine is building up, phosphocreatine is depleted, which obviously I think you guys know that will decrease your power and, and power is related to jumping and change of direction, sprinting. So you'll get a reduction in performance. And after a single sprint in this study by Dawson in 97, phosphocreatine levels drop to 55% of the resting levels after just a single sprint. Okay? But after repeated sprints, it dropped down to 27%. And if we go back to those slides and we see that phosphocreatine is the primary supplier of energy in the first sprint, and it's also the primary supplier in the last sprint, but we can't actually maintain it across sprints, then this is a limiting factor. So we can't really do a whole lot about increasing how much phosphocreatine we have in the muscle. Maybe there's some training strategies, some, some supplementation, okay? But what we do have control of is, is training to restore phosphocreatine faster. This is the most important slide of the presentation for me, not necessarily for you. But as I was advancing this presentation, I wanted to really go a little bit deeper and understand the phosphate, the, uh, phosphate shuttle or the phosphagen shuttle a little bit more. And I presented this a couple months ago at uh, the basketball conference, and I've taken this slide a little bit further. Okay, so. As we start to exercise, we get blood flow to the muscle, okay? And now, oxygen starts to diffuse across the cytoplasm to the mitochondria. Now the mitochondria starts to produce ATP, and that's produced in the inner membrane. That ATP wants to diffuse to the cytoplasm, but it has a hard time doing that. It doesn't, it's a bulky molecule and it can't get through the outer membrane of the mitochondria very easily. But the creatine easily diffuses in. Does that look familiar? ATP and creatine? There it is. That's a reversible reaction. And we have mitochondrial creatine kinase. It reverses the reaction. So the ATP we've created in the mitochondria is delivered to the cytoplasm by this reaction, and this is the rate limiting reaction for, for delivering a mitochondrial ATP to the muscle, to the cytoplasm. And therefore, your rate of fossil creatine recovery is a direct indicator of the res respiratory capacity of the muscle. That's pretty important, okay? So this process takes time. You just saw this, 55% after the first sprint, 30 seconds later, creatine is restored up to about 69% of resting levels. And three minutes later, it's up to 90%. Still not 100% of resting yet. After multiple sprints, we're at 45% after 30 seconds rest, and we're still not close to 100% after a three minute rest. That's a short rest period, and sometimes that's all we have in sport. So this process takes time, and if we were able to track phosphocreatine recovery for that whole period, which we can do now with MRI, you get this mono-exponential curve with a fast phosphocreatine recovery constant and a slow. Dr. Elmer, a uh, researcher from the lab I'm getting my PhD in, did a power recovery study. He had individuals do 30 seconds of maximal effort cycling, and then he had them sit for 15 seconds, and he made them do three seconds of max power. They were only at 42%. 45 seconds later, at 45 seconds after that 30-second sprint, he had them do another three-second sprint. They're at 75%. Three minutes and 20 seconds later, they're at 92%, and that's kind of just like that phosphocreatine recovery curve. 10 minutes later, they still weren't fully recovered. My question is, can we train our athletes to speed up the recovery of our power output? 
I hope so. Because I've put a lot of time into this. Okay? So it, it is possible. Because slow twitch bias muscle, those with a greater relative uh, distri distribution of slow twitch muscle um, compared to fast twitch, actually restore phosphocreatine a lot faster than those with fast twitch bias muscle. Now, you guys will have to train a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot to make your athletes slow twitch, especially with all the strength training and, and athletic training and power training that you're doing. You'll have to do a lot of work to make them become slow. I'm not asking you to do that. I just want you to consider the idea to train your athletes in a way that gives them what I like to call super muscle. High power, high, enduri high endurance muscle. It's called super muscle. And we, this is actually present in track cyclists. They have some of the highest powers recorded on bikes, and they have some of the great highest muscle respiratory capacities. Super muscle. That's, that's what I like. Okay? So, the point is that repeated sprint fatigue depends on the rate of phosphocreatine recovery. That's a direct indicator of muscle respiratory capacity. The critical power may be a surrogate of our muscle's oxidative capacity or respiratory capacity. Uh, the critical power is something you heard about a couple days ago. It's not something I've always known about. In fact, I dove in at ACSM last year in May, and I just watched talk after talk after talk on this topic because I wanted to learn more about it. So it's brand new to me. I'm trying to let you guys know that I'm just regurgitating some of the research, and I'm going to share some of mine. That's all I'm trying to do. Okay? Now, the critical power basically states that we have a finite amount of work we can give at any given work rate. So at high intensity efforts, we don't last very long. But then when we go to really slow, easy efforts to the point of walking, all right, or sitting and resting, we get this ex mono exponential curve, and the asymptote of that curve is your creatine power, or <laughs> creatine power, your critical power. Now, let's define it, and this is according to Andrew Jones. Critical power is the highest rate of oxidative energy transduction which can be sustained without continuously drawing on the energy store work prime. Yesterday, Landon said that work prime is your anaerobic work capacity. Um, that definition may be slightly inaccurate because work prime is defined as a finite amount of work that can be performed above the critical power whose energy is derived from phosphocreatine, glycogen, and a small aerobic contribution. At the onset of exercise, all energy systems turn on simultaneously. So that's why it would be inaccurate to say it's your anaerobic work capacity because there is an aerobic contribution to the work prime. Okay? It's a finite amount of work. So if we know what your athlete's critical power is, or if this is running, if we know what their critical speed is, then we can actually predict very accurately how long they will last at intensities greater than their critical speed or their critical power. And that amount is finite. So at any of these points, that amount of work above the critical power is the same. So we can use this to our advantage to predict what our athletes are able to give, and we can use that to determine training zones for our athletes, individual training zones. So how do we test for critical power? We do critical power on the bike, but we can test for critical speed through running tests. Oh, this is really important. I'm sorry. I keep getting ahead of myself. See, I'm not really looking at this as I go, and it's not down here. I apologize. Okay. The, uh, the reason why critical power might be a surrogate of your muscle oxidative capacity is because when we exercise at our critical power, we don't use up our work prime. And you can see that the phosphocreatine drops down a little bit at first, but then it just stabilizes. Okay? So we, we have this reserve, this you know, high energy reserve if we're exercising at or below our critical power. But as soon as we go above it, we start to use up our work prime until ultimately we reach VO2 max, and then we fail. 
Okay, so that's why this, this critical power is this point where is this point that defines our oxidative capacity of our athletes. And we can train our athletes to improve it. So now let's talk about how to test it. This is a great protocol. Um, Clark and colleagues did a 100 meter sprint, a 400 meter sprint, and a 1500 meter sprint. You give your best effort. I like this protocol because they did it all in one day. So they took, I think, 12 minutes or so between, no, it might, I, think, I believe it was five minutes of rest between the 100 and the 400, and then 12 or 15 minutes of rest before the 1500. They did it all on the same day. And the reason why I like this protocol is because some coaches love to see their athletes working hard. They really like it. I've done VO2 max graded exercise tests with our athletes, and the coaches walk in and go, what are you doing? I've done lactate threshold with our basketball players, and I'm pricking blood from the fingers. And the coach is like, what are you doing? You're looking at all this blood stuff. But as soon as we go out to the track and we just run them, they get all excited about that. So uh, I haven't used this protocol. I like it. I want to use it, but I haven't used it yet. The protocol we use is the one by, and excuse my pronunciation, by Donati. And that's because our basketball coach, Coach Kristoviak, likes to do a two-mile run with the team as it is. It's like his thing. We just do it. And you guys know that when your coach says this is what we're going to do, well, you know we have to kind of allow that until we can maybe change their minds and, and influence them down the road somewhere. So we allow it. But because we're already doing it, it made sense to use this protocol because now we all, all we have to do is run a mile. Two miles is, you know, 3,200 meters. One mile is 1,600, so it still applies. In the slope of this line, when I plot distance over time, that slope is your critical speed. So let's give an example. Here's an athlete, not very fit athlete. A male, not very fit, okay? Seven minute mile, and these are arbitrary numbers. And then the two mile was done in 15 minutes. That slope is 7.5 miles an hour, okay? Here's another athlete in a little bit better shape. Six minute mile, and the two minute, or the two mile took 12 minutes, 45 seconds. Critical speed is 8.9 miles per hour. So if these two individuals, um, are facing each other in a competitive situation, maybe it, it's particularly one where you have to have a lot of submaximal movement like soccer or basketball. And if you can exploit and you know somehow that your opponent that's going to be facing you has a lower critical speed than you do, you could outrun him and use up his work prime and then when it's time, and without even tapping into yours, when it's time to go, you can push. It's a strategy that can be used to your advantage if you're willing to do this type of testing to find out what that is. All right, bonus point. Higher muscle respiratory capacity allows more mitochondrial ATP provision. Okay, this is a bonus point because as you get towards that last sprint, you see that when you go from the first sprint, there's a small aerobic component, but in the last sprint, it's huge, okay? So if you get to a point to where you're fatigued, you're going to have to tap into your ability to produce mitochondrial ATP to, to, to supply energy for sprinting, which won't, may not be that fast if you're fatigued, okay? But if that's more than the other guy, you have an advantage. All right, let's talk about training to improve it. Now, I have a couple people in the audience who are going to do some aerobic conditioning intervals, and we're going to wake up again. Who are those? I know Coach Sweet was going to help me. And uh, was there anyone else who's going to help me with that? Okay, I'm going to need a couple volunteers. Okay, I got, oh, look at this guy right here. He just ran sprints. No, you didn't run the sprints. You did. He ran the sprints, and now he's going to do the intervals. Do I have anyone else? This isn't going to be as hard. Come on. Okay, I need 10 people to do this. I promise it won't be that bad, and I'll even let you choose how far you have to run, okay? So, Coach Sweet, you're in charge of getting me 10 people, all right? Can you get that done? I hear you're a girl who can get things done. Thank you. All right. Come on, guys. You're going to do this with your athletes? Step up and do some conditioning. All right, here we go. But we're going to get to that in a minute. You guys just start moving around and warming up a little bit. All right. So the first step is to improve your single sprint performance. 
We've been talking about that all weekend, haven't we? So, power is work divided by time. What is work? What's work? Force times displacement. And if we substitute that into the equation, power is force times displacement over time. What's displacement over time? Velocity. So if you've passed your CSCS, and I know probably everyone in here has, then power equals force times velocity, and that's one of your questions on the test. All right? That's the definition that I like to use because it tells you right there how we should train for power. High force actions, action movements and, and training strategies that increase the maximal uh, force producing capabilities of our muscle combined, high force, high velocity actions, and then high velocity <coughs> actions, muscular actions. That's it. And I, I'm not going to say anything more about it because I know most of the presentations at this conference have covered this topic in a different shape or form. Proving muscle respiratory capacity. That's the next step to increasing your repeated sprint ability, and that's what this talk is really about. This is, what, this is the beginning of the continuum that I would call long, slow distance training. And here's a study by Jenkins and Quigley in 92. It's pretty old, but they did 30 to 40 minutes of continuous running at your critical power. So it was actually cycling. And they did that three times a week for eight weeks. That's a, probably a little much, right? It, I mean, sometimes we don't even have eight street weeks to train our athletes. But this is probably a little bit mu much. But the point is that it improved the critical power. And if you don't believe me that the critical power may contribute to restoring phosphocreatine, then Phil Skiba and his work has shown that with some mathematics that I don't really understand, to be honest with you. Not yet. Okay. Um, there's another type of training, and that's called your high-intensity aerobic interval training using moderate duration intervals at your maximum aerobic speed or the velocity at which you reach your VO2 max. We heard about that a little bit yesterday. And these individuals did 6 to 12 two-minute intervals at the power, so it's a cycling protocol at which they reach VO2, they took one minute rest. They did that for five weeks. They assessed their ability to restore phosphocreatine after this training protocol. And 60 seconds after exercise, you can see that phosphocreatine recovered in the muscle a lot faster. And that's the window we have to deal with during repeated sprint exercise during practice and play. That's our window. So this type of training is extremely valuable. Now, your highly trained aerobic endurance athletes can probably hold that pace for around six minutes, give or take. But the, most of the athletes we deal with in team sports can't do that as long. Three minutes is a great starting point for me with a lot of athletes from different sports. Um, basketball, our basketball team uses this a lot, and three minutes is kind of our starting point. But I don't think you guys will have a lot of success if you have your athletes running six-minute intervals at this pace because they won't be able to sustain the pace. Right? It'll run them into the ground, especially when you're doing multiple intervals. Here's another high-intensity aerobic training style that has been well-researched. It's using short intervals, 15 to 30 seconds at or above your maximum aerobic speed, usually a little bit above because we'll give usually a one to one work to rest ratio or a two to one. And because we have that rest in between, we can recharge a little bit of our work prime in that small window. And so we can usually handle a slightly greater intensity than our maximum aerobic speed. All right. Okay. Uh, runners, you don't have to do this. This is what we call, you guys can sit down. Thank you. Maybe you're standing to recover and everything. I appreciate it. Uh, this is what we would call sprint interval training, is what it's defined in the research. They call it sprint interval training. And it, I kind of like to say it's like a glycolytic form of training because you're doing these 30-second all-out sprints. And in 30 seconds, the glycolytic energy system uh, becomes like the dominating 
uh, supplier of energy. So I like to call it glycolytic intervals, or sprint interval training is the way it's used in the research. And it's very potent. In this study, they did uh, four to six 30-second all-out sprints with four minutes rest. And they did it two to three times a week. And they only did it for two weeks. Now, this isn't a... Uh, they didn't measure phosphocreatine recovery, but what it did do was improve cytochrome oxidase, which lives in the electron transport chain to produce ATP from the mitochondria. So it does improve some level of uh, respiratory capacity of the muscle. And so I want you guys to pay attention, close attention to a theme here. Long, slow distance aerobic training improves the critical power. High intensity. Moderate duration aerobic training intervals, your maximum aerobic speed, improves your phosphocreatine recovery, right? High intensity, short interval aerobic training intervals improve your maximal aerobic speed, which is related to your critical speed. And sprint interval training improves markers of mitochondrial capacity. So we can stop arguing over the different methods that we use. All right, we can stop arguing over it. What I encourage you guys to do is I encourage you guys to hone in on what works for you and just get really good at implementing that protocol and dive into that line of research that teaches you what the best protocols are to give you the best results from the time you have to use this method. But I want you to be open-minded because Training is about the culture, the problem at hand, the opponents you face. If Oregon changes their methods and then all of a sudden we go back to smash mouth football and we're standing around, then we'll change our conditioning methods. But we're training our athletes in a way right now to overcome a few of the opponents we face every year. We have to. Not just to match our style of play and help our athletes withstand the stresses of our own game, but to withstand the stresses of our opponent's game. I may not do that for, you know, a non-conference team, one-off team, but the teams we play every single year are the teams I watch, and I try to understand how do they play? How can our players withstand that and maybe have a chance to beat them? Especially if they're maybe a little bit higher skill and they already are um, a team with uh, greater genetics and, and better talent because of recruiting. So, the point here is that be open to changing your method so that it helps you solve the problem. Right? You may come into a program, your coach says, this is how I want to train. And instead of fighting that, you go, you know what, coach? I can train like that. And you slowly mold that coach into one of these training forms that gives the coach what he wants, but also the athletes what they need. Right? 